Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. Today we're going to be talking about schizophrenia. A severe mental disorder that affects approximately 1 in 300 people worldwide is hallucinations, which are false perceptions of things that aren't really there. Another symptom of schizophrenia is delusions, which are false beliefs that the person holds despite evidence to the contrary. Delusions can be of various types, such as paranoid delusions, grandiose delusions, and somatic delusions. And paranoid delusions are the most common type of delusion in schizophrenia. They involve the belief that someone or something is out to get the person. They may believe that they are being followed, watched, or plotted against. They may also think that they have special powers or abilities that others do not have. With grandiose delusions, the person believes that they are special or important in some way, that they are a famous person, a historical figure, or a religious figure. They may also believe that they have a special mission or purpose in life. And there are somatic delusions where the person believes that something is wrong with their body. They may believe that they have a serious illness or that their body is being affected by some external force. A third symptom of schizophrenia is disorganized thinking and speech. This can manifest in several ways, such as difficulty speaking logically or coherently, difficulty following in conversation, or understanding what others are saying. They may jump from one topic to another without making sense, or they may have trouble understanding what others are saying. Disorganized speech is a reflection of this disordered thinking, and it can make it difficult for others to understand what the person is trying to say. For example, a person with schizophrenia may start a sentence by talking about the weather and then suddenly switch to discussing a movie they saw last night. Or, they may use words and phrases that don't make sense in the context of the conversation. This can make it challenging for others to follow along and understand what the person is trying to communicate. Also, note that disorganized thinking and speech are not the same as forgetfulness or difficulty communicating. These symptoms are specific to schizophrenia and are caused by changes in the brain that affect how a person processes information. People with schizophrenia often experience a lack of motivation or interest in life, as well as difficulty with daily tasks such as grooming, hygiene, and self-care. Understanding the symptoms of schizophrenia is crucial to get an early diagnosis and proper treatment. Remember, if you or someone you know is experiencing any of the signs we discussed in this video, such as hallucinations, delusions, disordered thinking, or abnormal behavior, you should seek professional help. These little rings are magnetic cores. They're really small. The memory portion of a general electric computer contains 170,000 of these tiny cores threaded on matrices. They store the information fed to the computer. This vibrator jig is used in place of manually aligning the individual cores for threading. The operator is pouring 2,400 cores into the jig. Each tiny core is vibrated into its proper position, and in a matter of seconds, each core is in perfect alignment. Here, the 2,400 cores, properly aligned, are placed in the assembly fixture prior to threading. The wire is now easily threaded through every core. In the following close-up, watch the wire as it moves diagonally from upper right to lower left. It can best be seen crossing the center square. In case you missed the action, here it is again. The core memory matrix, still in its original assembly jig, is now undergoing testing, again completely automatic. Each core is individually tested. A bit of information is electronically read into each core. It remains there for a moment and is then read out. This readout must be within specifications. Each memory plane must be assembled with other planes and electronically connected to form the complete memory. This is a completed memory, ready for installation. I want to welcome everyone to this hearing of the Military Personnel Subcommittee. Today's hearing is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion and its impact on the Department of Defense and the Armed Services. I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today. I hope this hearing provides the opportunity for our members to have a productive exchange with our witnesses and provide answers to their questions. Let me set the stage by saying the military services continue to be one of the most meritocratic organizations in the United States of America. Thanks to the principles established by President Truman in Executive Order 9981, that there shall be equal treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed services without regard to race, color, religion, or national origin. These principles enabled me, a working class kid from Indiana, to be the first in my family to go to college and later join the Navy Reserves and serve my country in uniform. That is what meritocracy provides an opportunity for everyone, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, or gender, to raise your right hand to serve your country and to succeed on hard work and determination alone. And that is why I, what I found in the Navy. No evidence of widespread racism, just sailors of every color, background, or religion working hard to get the mission done. But we are now in danger of losing those meritocratic principles to the politicization of our arms, armed forces. Thanks first and foremost to the ever-expanding bureaucracy of diversity, equity, and inclusion policies, regulations, and trainings. This DEI apparatus is based in faulty science and misguided principles. In fact, anti-bias training efforts may be, quote, having literally any, any effect, including to actually increase bias. In a review of 418 prejudice reduction experiments, Elizabeth Le levy Palak and her co-authors concluded that much of the anti-basis training is, quote, misguided. And even in the few studies that showed any effect at all of reducing bias, those effects actually disappeared over a short period of time.
There are other really important holes in this research. For example, there are only two high quality studies of diversity training and very few studies of whether implicit bias training works or if implicit bias changes following any kind of training. And what this means is that two of our most popular responses to racist, sexist, or other kinds of prejudiced events in the world to give people this kind of training has no support in the research as an effective tool for action. Perhaps some of it is effective, but for several reasons, including that many of these trainings are proprietary businesses, many companies refuse to open their doors to researchers when they are engaging in these trainings, we don't know if they're working, and even if they're having negative effects. Yet the Department of Defense and the services have embraced DEI training full cloth without empirical evidence. And worse, they very well may be increasing racism and division in our military. As I mentioned, I used to think that better research would help us to answer this question of what reduces prejudice, because there are many good ideas out there. But this present research that we just completed has left me facing the possibility that better and better research on our current popular solutions will only show us that the programming is not doing much. And that's what this figure shows. So as the errors in the research get smaller, the size of the impact of the program gets smaller too. So these data suggest that if we keep using the same ideas, our improved research is going to show us that we're not changing anything at all, that the impacts of the average intervention is close to zero. This comes at a time when existential threats from China and Russia have never been uh, as pronounced as what they are, and at a time when recruiting struggles put our all-volunteer force on the brink. With, this, with these looming threats, we must emphasize the readiness of our armed forces. In a response to then-ranking member Senator James Inhofe of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Chairman Milley reported that DOD expended 5,359,311 man-hours for Secretary Austin's extremism stand-down, and a, an additional 529,711 man-hours for DEI-specific training. That is a lot of training hours spent away from honing warfighting capabilities, knowledge, and skills. Civilian control of the military is the bedrock of our system, and avoiding partisan political ideology is essential to the strength and viability of our military. Chairman Milley, Milley, uh, Chairman Milley crossed the line during an Armed Services Committee hearing in the summer of 2021. He testified that it's, it's important to study critical race theory because, quote, I want to understand white rage. What is it that made thousands of people assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America, end quote. The highest ranking military officer in our armed forces interrupted the Secretary of Defense, connected racism to the Capitol riot, all to score partisan political points while wearing the uniform. How should the Department of Defense think about critical race theory? Can I make a comment, uh, Secretary? I'm sorry. Well, I'm very limited on my time, General Well, Lewis. I just want to make a comment. That the well, I know, but I, I, I've asked the question to Secretary Austin. I don't know what the, what the issue of critical race theory is and what the relevance here uh, in, with the department. We do not teach critical race theory. We don't, we don't embrace uh, critical race theory. And I think, I think that's a spurious uh, uh, conversation. Should we be surprised by the erosion of trust between the administration and our service members? or between our military and the American public. This cannot continue. Our service members and our nation deserve a military that does not make ideological judgments. I agree with Secretary Austin, who testified in the same hearing that all service members and DOD civilians, quote, deserve an environment free of discrimination, hate, and harassment. I would like to yield some of my time to General Milley because I know that he had some comments that he wanted to make when Representative Gates was talking. Sure. Um, first of all, on the issue of critical race theory, et cetera, I'll obviously have to get much smarter on whatever the theory is. Um, but I do think it's important, actually, uh, for those of us in uniform to be open-minded and be widely read. And the United States Military Academy is a university. Uh, and it is important that we train and we understand. Uh, and I, I want to understand white rage. And I'm white. And I want to understand it. So what is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America? What caused that? I want to find that out. I want to maintain an open mind here. And I do want to analyze it. It's important that we understand that. Because our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and guardians, they come from the American people. So it is important that the leaders now and in the future, do understand it. I've read Mao Zedong. I've read, I've read Karl Marx. I've read Lenin. That doesn't make me a communist. So what is wrong with understanding, having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend? And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers, of being, quote, woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. That was started at Harvard Law School years ago, and it proposed that there were laws in the United States, anti-bellum laws prior to the Civil War, that led to uh, a power differential with African Americans that were three quarters of a human being when this country was formed. And then we had a Civil War and Emancipation Proclamation to change it. And we brought it up to the Civil Rights Act in 1964. It took another 100 years to change that. So look it, I do want to know. And I respect your service, and you and I are both Green Berets. But I want to know. And it matters to our military and the discipline and cohesion of this military. And I thank you for the opportunity to make a comment on that. Thank you, General. Alcohol-related deaths in 2020, 13.1 per 100,000. We talking about regulating any more alcohol? We talking about banning it? We're talking about making new rules to make it harder to get alcohol? No. Deaths by car, vehicles, 38,824, 11.2 per 100,000. Anybody want to ban cars? Any talk of that? No. And as Brian Tyler Cohen pointed out, it's obvious, driving a car requires licensing, testing, background checks, rigorous safety regulations, insurance, and aid restrictions. But of course, for MAGA Republicans, they don't want to uh, bring that up. So, Mr. Bosco, your brace is not a ghost gun, correct? Is this an insurrection? 
So will they be held to the same? Uh, I don't want another January 6th, do we? Yeah, if they're trying stuff. to overthrow the government, they ought to be held to the same standard, but I think they're trying to express their position. Whoa, 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 whoa. Members out of line. Point of order, the gentleman's time has expired. Yeah, and here's a point of order. Uh, you, weren't here you weren't here to begin with. Ms. Jackson Lee went four and a half minutes over. We said that we were going to take, I was going to take one additional minute, and Mr. Biggs was going to take one additional minute. She went over by four and a half minutes. Mr. Bosco. And of course, Jamie Raskin, who has been showing a masterclass in how to articulate the truth intelligently, compassionately, compare what Pat Fallon said and did. We die of gun violence in America than in any other industrialized country on earth, whether we're talking about Canada or Germany or France, United Kingdom, Japan, Israel, you name it. They know that the states with the highest rates of firearm, firearm deaths are the ones with the weakest gun laws and the states with the lowest levels of firearm deaths have the strongest gun laws. But they say that all of this chaos and destruction is just the necessary price we have to pay because of the Second Amendment. All those thousands of people gunned down at church and school, at the Walmart, in parks and grocery stores are just the human sacrifice we've decided to pay as a society for our Second Amendment. My colleagues, this is a lie. Our colleagues advance a completely flawed theory of the Second Amendment, which leads them to oppose even reasonable common sense gun safety rules that the Supreme Court has approved and which the vast majority of Americans endorse. Our colleagues embrace what's called the insurrectionist theory of the Second Amendment. Our colleague, Mr. Gates, says the Second Amendment is, quote, about maintaining within the citizenry the ability to maintain an armed rebellion against the government if that becomes necessary. Our colleague, Chip Roy, says the Second Amendment was designed purposefully to empower the people to resist the force of tyranny used against them. And Congressman Boebert says the Second Amendment, quote, has nothing to do with hunting unless you're talking about hunting tyrants, maybe. Well, this theory is completely debunked and destroyed by the text of the Constitution itself and by Supreme Court precedent. And yet their theory of the Second Amendment is killing Americans. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 of the Constitution gives Congress the power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union and suppress insurrections and invasions. The Republican Guarantee Clause tells the U.S. Congress to guarantee a Republican form of government to the states and to protect them against domestic violence. There are six other provisions in the Constitution, including the Treason Clause, that debunk what they're saying. And we're going to have to get through their false notion of the Second Amendment in order to save human life. Thank you. I yield back. In 2020, per capita murder rates were 40 percent higher in states won by Donald Trump than those won by Joe Biden. Nine of the 10 states with the highest gun mortality rates, including my state of Missouri, are red states. Mr. Wilcox, first of all, thank you for your strong, well-informed advocacy. Um, I want to build on Mr. Nadler's question. Can you explain how the Iron Pipeline and weak Republican laws, uh, gun laws disproportionately harm black and brown communities? Uh, yes, Ranking Member, and thank you for the question. Um, as, as you stated, what we see pretty clearly from examining gun laws and looking at rates of gun violence is states with stronger gun laws see less gun violence. Uh, why is that? It's because it's too easy for guns to be illegally diverted from legal commerce, responsible law-abiding citizens, into gun trafficking channels. What are the ways that that happens? No background check gun sales, straw purchasing, gun theft, and rogue gun dealers. Uh, we're here to talk about ATF, and that is exactly what they're there to focus on, is that diversion of illegal guns. Because we have to invest in communities, but we also have to stop the flow of illegal guns. And that's exactly what ATF is here to do, and that's exactly why we need them to be well-resourced and supported in doing it. One of the most troubling things... Going back to Pat Fallon, this is a uh, really tragic moment in the hearing where uh, the MAGA Republican chairman, Pat Fallon, is kicking out Manuel Oliver and Patricia Oliver. Um, now, Manuel Oliver lost a child in the Parkland uh, shooting, and uh, it sounds like it was a minor outburst just for a second. And based on that, first he kicks out Patricia and says, please remove that woman, and then kicks out Manuel Oliver without even really any warning. Here, play this clip. Uh, gun control in Mexico is very strict. In fact, for all intents and purposes, it's very difficult for an average Mexican citizen, although the Constitution says they can own a gun, it's very difficult for them to do so. And also, every single firearm in Mexico is supposed to be registered. Mexico has 124 million people. Uh, what, 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 ma'am? Ma'am? Okay. All right. Officer, uh, how she goes? She goes no. Please remove that woman, please. Yes, officer, please. You're removed. You're, you're breaching protocol and disorder in the committee room. He never took anyone away. No, no. Officer, please remove her. And remove the gentleman, too. And I'm going to read a statement for the other uh, folks in attendance. The, the committee welcomes the public to this meeting. We have people on both sides of the aisle. We have people on both sides of the aisle that uh, not only up here, but in the audience that have differing opinions. While you are welcome here, I want to point out to the members and to the audience in attendance today, House Rule 11 provides that the chairman of the committee may punish breaches of order and decorum by censure and exclusion from the hearing. All participants will be required to avoid unruly behavior and inappropriate language. Expressions of support or opposition are not in order. I expect all parties to these proceedings to conduct themselves at all times in a manner that reflects credibility on the House of Representatives. Okay. Now I'm going to reclaim my time. And here is Congressman Eric Swalwell um, thanking the activists for their attendance. And I want to thank the activists uh, who have stayed uh, in this fight uh, for gun safety, reasonable gun safety, uh, and, and thank you for showing up today. Uh, I'm also sorry that you were targeted uh, earlier. Uh, you know, the same people that want to have you arrested and put in jail want to go to the D.C. jail this week to take the January 6th terrorists out, uh, if you can believe that or not. Probably shouldn't be surprised that this hearing has uh, deviated to include Hunter Biden's laptop. And for such a serious issue like this, I would encourage my colleagues 
to go through Hunter Biden's laptop on their own time. Uh, whatever they want to see uh, in there, they should do that on their own time and, and not when we have such an important topic like gun safety. I also have to just say, though, is this. Here is Congressman Eric Swalwell also talking about how this MAGA Republican gang is not interested in backing the blue. Play this clip. I'm a little surprised, especially growing up in a Republican family, uh, that my colleagues have abandoned uh, the position I've, I've long known them to hold, which is to uh, defend and protect the police. Uh, and instead, they have brought here a witness who said, the cops. And they have among their ranks a colleague who sells campaign merchandise that says, defund the FBI. And the title of this is ATF's assault on the Second Amendment. This is a law enforcement agency charged with protecting the community. And so what we are really coming to find is that this gang is not interested in backing the blue. They're entirely interested in backing the coup. They don't stand up for the officers who protected us at the Capitol that day. And certainly by bringing witnesses here today that say the cops, we know that that's exactly where they stand. Otherwise, they wouldn't have invited somebody like that. But which and finally, we've seen this over and over again. Here's MAGA Republican Matt Gates. He thinks he has a gotcha moment with the ATF. The nonpartisan government accountability office issues a report in June of 2016. Firearms data. The ATF did not always comply with the Appropriations Act restriction and should better adhere to its policies. Uh, Mr. Wilcox, you're the witness the Democrats have invited here today. Are you familiar with that report? I am. And does the fact that the ATF broke the law concern you? Um, the report, I believe, supported ATF's action in cataloging records to stop crime. I'll read from it. It says, a technical defect allows ATF agents to access data, including purchaser data, beyond what ATF policy permits. Do you take any umbrage with that conclusion? ATF has been collecting out-of-business records pursuant to a law signed by Ronald Reagan, and President Trump digitized more records than any other president. I don't care who did it. I'm just worried about the impact on my citizens. And I would acknowledge there may be Republican presidents who didn't do enough in the 80s to protect our gun rights. But So now I want to read for you this quote, and I want you to think for a minute who may have said this quote. The quote is as follows. The government is afraid of the guns people have because they have, to, they have control of the people at all times, because they have to have control of the people at all times. Once you take away the guns, you can do anything to the people. You give them an inch and they take a mile. I believe we are slowly turning into a socialist government. The government is continually growing bigger and more powerful, and the people need to prepare to defend themselves against government control. Okay, now who do you think said that quote? I'll just pause for a minute as you think. The person who said that quote is Timothy McVeigh, the terrorist who committed the Oklahoma City bombing. And essentially, this is now the base that MAGA Republicans are radicalizing, are courting, this is the base. When Marjorie Taylor Greene says the base, the base, the base, it is people who share those views that Timothy McVeigh said. The MAGA Republican leaders are basically saying those exact things at these hearings. So enough is enough of normalizing this behavior. That's why we show you here on the Midas Touch Network what is actually going down at these hearings. So you can send these videos to friends, families, colleagues, coworkers, neighbors, whoever. Let's educate people what's going on here because look, we don't want our family members to be killed by senseless gun violence because weapons of war proliferate without even any common sense regulation. Look, I'm for the Second Amendment. I believe that people should have guns for hunting. I believe that people can have guns for self-defense. I think that when we are talking about certain types of weapons of war, the same way we're talking about when you drive a truck or if you have a motorcycle or if you have certain types of vehicles or um, depending on the types of alcohol that's being sold, you know, that there is a common sense regulatory scheme in place that is directed at making sure responsible gun owners can get guns, but that irresponsible gun owners don't get guns. I, I don't espouse the insurrectionist view of the Second Amendment that we should be irresponsibly proliferating weapons of war to militarize right-wing extremists to overthrow our government in insurrections. I don't. I believe in a Second Amendment that says what the Second Amendment says, and like other areas of our laws and our Constitution, where necessary, there could be common sense regulations so that we could all go about living our lives with peace, without the fear that there's going to be shootings when we're in public places with AR-15s that are intended for war. By the way, when those weapons are used in war, they don't just give the weapons to a soldier and say, start shooting soldier. The soldier has to be taught how to use the weapon. They have to pass tests to be able to use the weapon. So our military, they have to go through training. They have to pass tests. But we're saying that for the general public, that anybody, you know, once once they turn 18 or whatever the age is going to be, they, they could just go and get guns with like the most minimal of checks, if at all. They could just get weapons of war willy-nilly. That, that makes sense? It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Nothing that's coming from this MAGA Republican Party makes sense at all. So it's on all of us to call it out. We're going to keep calling it out here on the Midas Touch Network. Good to be with you, Margaret. Based on our reporting, 
The special counsel is tightening his investigation around former President Trump when it comes to January 6th, now compelling some of his top aides and allies to testify under oath about their private conversations with Trump. That means there's no privilege, no executive privilege they can cite to try to block any kind of testimony on those issues. We know the special counsel is looking into a possible conspiracy case against Trump and people around him about trying to block the congressional proceedings on January 6th. We're going to potentially hear now from Mark Meadows, Robert O'Brien, the former national security advisor, John Ratcliffe, the former director of national intelligence and sources who are close to the grand jury also tell CBS News that they're being asked witnesses about what kind of national security levers Trump was asking about in those final days. It's so rare for a judge to say to a lawyer, you now have to testify about your client in a criminal case. Well, that happened in this classified records investigation of Trump being conducted by the special counsel. Two investigations at once. Evan Corcoran, Trump's lawyer in this case, now being told to come in, and he did come in for hours on Friday. And he didn't just talk about his broad view. He had to share audio files, notes, details about all of his conversations with Trump about how Trump handled those federal requests about classified documents. Think back to the Mar-a-Lago FBI search last summer. Corcoran was pressed about what was Trump doing at that intense time. And that really gives the prosecutors a prism into what really happened.